Alright. All right. Yeah, so you were asking what to do, for, what about the final? It's on 15 December, right? You, you already saw that. And the, the focus is definitely on the, the new material after, after the midterm, but certainly you will need <laughs> the, the basic stuff too, right? Yeah, I posted yesterday the page rank, so that should be relatively straightforward. Just implement what we talked about on Monday for, I gave you like a sparse Google, no, sparse link matrix. You have to augment it with these two other components and basically, and, and run, run the page rank. <coughs> Try it for yourselves, okay? All right, so today I would like to finish, well, maybe not completely finish SVD. There are some aspects to, of SVD which I would like, or uh, I guess applications, which I will save for Monday. That's, that's going to be the last lecture, right? The next Monday, if I'm counting correctly. Okay, good. So that, that's about right, because the SVD is sort of the, the climax, the pinnacle of the course, because it nicely ties together most of the previous concepts. It ties together the subspaces, the four fundamental subspaces with the notion of orthonormality and eigenvectors. So the SVD, I, I keep saying, is like this big sledgehammer of, of linear algebra because it's, it's sort of, or if I should say it in Tolkien way, it's like one theorem to rule them all. <laughs> but don't quote me on that. So how does the, this, this, this theorem look like if I should write it actually as a theorem. So what did we do last time? I, last time I sort of explained what SVD is and how does it work and what is contained in the matrices of left and right single vectors, right? But today I would actually like to give you a proof and the proof, uh, the proof that it always exists. And the proof is going to be constructive that I, I will show you how to find the SVDs. It's actually not so difficult. So if we write it as a theorem, then it says that for any given matrix, and we will be looking at real matrices, R, R, N by N, so the matrix can be rectangular. That means that we can always find there exists a matrix U, which is an orthonormal matrix M by M. Okay, so this OM, that's not asymptotic complexity, not to be confused, that means orthonormal matrix M by M, okay. There exists a, another orthonormal matrix, which is n by n, which is called V. And there is also a matrix sigma, which is a very special type of n by n matrix. So the sigma is n by n, and the sigma looks like this. The sigma is, basic, uh, I think we called it the rank normal form. So what it means, it's basically the rectangular version of a diagonal matrix. Can you see this clearly? This a little bit better. Yeah, the projector does not have as good contrast as I would be hoping for. Are you okay with that, or would you like me to switch up the lights? Is it good? Okay. So the sigma is basically like a rectangular generalization of a diagonal matrix, or I think we call it also rank normal form. So it has zeros almost everywhere except for this R by R, by R submatrix, which is diagonal. Okay, so everywhere else are zeros. And these numbers are real. And moreover, we also can assume that they are ordered. So that the sigma one is the largest one, and then they are uh, not strictly decreasing up to sigma R. That's the last non zero one. And after the uh, sigma R that they are the if you if you would continue on the diagonal you would just see zeros okay oh this is for the case that n would be more than m but of course if it was the other if the matrix was the tall and tall and skinny matrix that would be the same the same idea it would just be here okay so just like here here I put the short and fat matrix as an example but it works equally well for tall and skinny one. So the theorem says that for any given matrix A, there exists U and V, which are orthonormal, and the sigma, which is basic, which is the rank normal form matrix. Oh, uh, I should have said what this R is. This R, the R is the rank of A. And A can be written as a matrix multiplication of U sigma VT. 
So that's why it's called the decomposition. Basically, you are given an input matrix A, and then the statement of the SVD theorem is that you can find matrices U, V, and sigma with all these properties, such that when you multiply them together, when you multiply U, sigma, and VT, you get back exactly A. Okay, so that's a way sort of to analyze A, to understand what is going on in A. That's one way. And that's basically, I guess, the most canonical way to analyze what a matrix does or what, 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 a, what a, an arbitrary matrix is. So here you can see one immediately one thing because the R here is the rank of A. So if somebody gives you SVD of the matrix then answering the question what's the rank of the matrix is really simple. Okay, because all you need to do is look at the sigma matrix and count the number of non-zero sigmas and you are done. That's, that's the rank of the matrix, okay? Well, it can, in practice, it can get a little, little bit more tricky if you are given some matrix which comes from data, like you measured something in the real world, then you can be looking at like sigma r, which would be like 10 to minus 15, and then you're like, is it already zero or is it not already zero? But at least, at least in theory, everything is beautiful, okay? In theory, you get just perfect zeros, you get a perfect, perfect non-zero. If you are dealing with data, then maybe there are some numerical inaccuracies that maybe 10 to minus 15 is, is, was already meant to be zero, just not zero due to numerical inaccuracies. Well, let's not worry about the, these numerical uh, aspects yet. Let's worry about how uh, do we actually prove that for any matrix A, we can always find these three matrices um, such that all these, all, all these uh, conditions hold, okay? And the proof is going to be constructive so to prove that they always exist we will basically find them we will find the u v and the, and the sigma such that this is true okay so let's do that there is uh, just a few tricks to do this so as i said before a is our input matrix and we are looking for its SVD, okay? So the trick number one is to look at ATA, okay? I guess that's, that's, that's really the key trick to it. Because A was uh, rectangular, so there is not a whole lot we can do with a rectangular matrix. But ATA, uh, things get much better because A, A was N by N, right? So ATA is gonna be N by N. And it's definitely symmetric, right? We, I think we, we had this, right? If you transpose it, you just get the same thing. That's, that's easy. I think we also said before that this is a positive semi-definite, right? Because if we hit it from the left with xt and from the right with x, we just get a dot product of ax with itself, and that's certainly greater or equal than zero, right? So that implies that this matrix is always at least positive semi-definite. It could also be positive definite in some cases, but not in general. So from this follows that, again, this, this SVD is beautiful. It's tie, tying to putting together all, all the stuff we had before. So that's what I'll be referring to. So this, uh, this implies that all the eigenvalues of ATA are greater or equal than zero. Okay, that's, that's one of the results we had when we talked about positive semi-definite matrices. So that's nice. Uh, more so that we have a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix and it's real. So we know, what we know from eigen decomposition is that we can um, find an orthonormal basis of Rn, that's the dimension of the matrix ATA, which is formed by eigenvectors of ATA, okay? So remember again from what we had before is that if, if I have a real symmetric matrix, then uh, everything is cool, that all the eigenvectors, then I have the full uh, set of eigenvectors and I can find, I can set them to be an orthonormal basis of the entire space I'm working in, in this case R2n, okay? Uh, here is another little trick. So since the eigenvalues, so if the eigenvalues, if I call them like lambda, lambda one up to lambda n, since the eigenvalues are or greater or equal than zero, then I can take their square root, okay? And I will call the square root the sigma. If you are guessing those are gonna be the singular values, then you are guessing right. So I take the square root of the eigenvalues, which I can do because they are non-negative, okay? And in that case, I can write the eigen eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector correspondence like this, right? Because uh, VI is an eigenvector of ATA, so I will call, I will call this orthonormal basis as V1 T1 
to the n. They are all vectors from Rn. They are orthonormal. And it's true that ATA di is sigma i squared di. Why? Because the sigma i is simply the square root of the eigenvalue. So if I square it, I, I get the eigenvalue formula. Is somebody calling me just in line? <coughs> okay. Yeah, that this is basically what I just said uh, in text. <laughs> and the set of eigenvectors is complete, means that if I write them as a columns of a matrix V, then this matrix is going to be orthonormal, okay? So that means that VTV is identity. I could also write it as VVT because it's a square orthonormal matrix. That, that means that everything works just fine, okay? And then this... Uh, this is basically how we get the right singular vectors. But um, I guess before I explain this, let's take a look at the null space of A. Okay. So uh, let's uh, think for a little bit about the null space of A. So one thing I think we also had before is that the null space of A and ATA are exactly the same. Remember this? Uh, the, the way to show this is, uh, I think we have this at some point. Well, uh, let's go quickly through that, okay? So if some, if some vector is in the null space of A, then it also easily must be in the null space of ATA, right? Because if I multiply this from the left with AT, then, um, Certainly AT0 is zero, so X is in the null space of ATA, right? So this tells me that the null space of A is a subset of null space of ATA. And the other way around, if something is the null space of ATA, that means I can certainly multiply it from the left with XT, do a dot product with XT, the, the zero will remain here, right? And what is this? This is just a dot product of AX with itself, the no squared norm of AX. Okay, so that means that the square norm of AX is zero, but that's only possible if AX itself is zero, right? And if, if, if AX was anything non-zero in the norm, that would immediately give me a non-zero uh, result, right? So this, this shows that if I go the other way, if I take the null space of ATA, that will be a subspace of NA. And because both of these in inclusions work, that doesn't leave any other uh, conclusion that NA must be equal to N. ATA, okay? So the null spaces are the same. So basically that's sort of one way to justify why it makes sense to be looking at ATA instead of on A, okay? And what else? <laughs> yep. Oh, it's not. It, it means like a set inclusion. That's one is oh, like subset okay. of other. So the null spaces are subspaces. Okay. Oh, so they have to be equal to one another. Yes. 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 Okay. Let let let, let oh, me okay. let me write it there as a conclusion, I guess. So if if you if you put these together, this implies that N A equals N A T A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Before the first. What's that? I think we did this. I think I, yeah, I I think we had this before. It's 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 fairly simple. <laughs> but we need this here because we are we are basic. What we are doing we are analyzing A by looking at ATA. So we are justifying the basically that makes sense because a, a lot of properties of A we can read from ATA. That's I guess sort of like the interpretation, if you will. Okay. All right. Uh -huh. So this tells us, uh, so uh, what we did here, we took the eigenvectors of ATA, okay, and what I'm saying is that the, if I, so remember R was the rank, so let me write it here, R is the rank of, of A, okay, whatever that is, 
and here what I'm saying is if, if I take the the remaining n minus r of them br plus 1 and so on up to bn okay then these vectors are certainly all in the null space of a okay because why because they are the vectors uh, they're the eigenvectors that correspond to zero eigenvalues okay because the matrix has rank r after i run out of the non-zero eigenvalues all of them must be zero okay so that means that these all these vectors have to be in the null space of ata but that's the same as the null space of a okay that's that's what we have just that's what we have just shown here uh, we also know from the four fundamental subspaces, we also know that the dimension of Na is N minus R, okay? But here we have N minus R orthonormal vectors, okay? So that means these guys, they have to be an uh, orthonormal basis for the null space, okay? So this, I guess I could, this, this, this split somewhere, wherever I, have, uh, wherever I have my VR, Somewhere here will be VR plus one, right? Here will be VR. So these last ones are, let me write it here, VR plus one up to VR are orthonormal basis for the null space of A. And, and this is why. Okay, so this is this is basically what the AT, what the eigen decomposition of ATA tells me about A. Okay, so that's sort of one piece of the uh, SPD construction, and another uh, important piece is this. The other way we could be analyzing this is instead of looking at ATA, we could be looking at AAT. Okay. So it, remember, A was an M by N matrix. So if I do AAT, it's going to be an M by M matrix. Okay. So it's to certainly different than ATA, right? Remember, ATA was N by N. Okay. So the matrices are not even the same dimension, right? If this is a rectangular matrix. But uh, they have a lot in common. So AAT certainly is also symmetric, right? If you transpose this entire thing, you get back AAT. It's also uh, just by exactly by the same argument, it's positive semi-definite, right? If I hit it with xt here and with x here, I always must get the number which is non-negative, which, which proves that AAT is positive semi-definite. At least it could also be positive definite. So just like in the ATA case, we also see that uh, I can do an eigen decomposition. I will get orthonormal eigenvectors of AAT and their eigenvalues certainly also must be non-negative because it's a, it's a positive semi-definite matrix. So all these arguments basically hold for AAT just as they did for ATA, even though this matrix is certainly quite different. It even has the same dimension. That's, that's what's written here. And the really important thing here, I guess maybe the key to SVD is that there is a relationship between the eigenvectors of ATA and AAT. Okay, that's what we mean by this convenient relationship, or as maybe in like, I would, we would call it cool relationship. So let's take a look at it. So before, here, here, here I took the eigenvectors of ATA. Okay. And what I'm saying here is that. The eigenvectors of ATA, if I multiply them with A, they will become eigenvectors of AAT. So let's take a look. How does that work exactly? Okay. Are you are you with me? Do you have any <laughs> doubts here? So if VI is an eigenvector of ATA with the with eigenvalue sigma i squared. Then if we just multiply this uh, from the left with, with A, then we get this, right? So we have A, A, T, A equals sigma I squared A, A, B, right? I just multiply this whole thing by A. That certainly must be, tr must, must be true. And that basically shows me just, just by rearranging this multiplication, just by applying the associativity of matrix multiplication, I immediately see that A, V, I is an eigenvector of A, A, T with the same eigenvalue, 
Okay, so because I, I have AVI here, I have AVI here, and I have the same eigenvalue, that's my sigma i squared, right? Which is just the square root of the original eigenvalue lambda i, the sigma. So that's quite interesting, right? That means, let me say it one, one more time, if I have an eigenvector of APA with this eigenvalue sigma i squared, that if I multiply this eigenvector with matrix A, I will get an eigenvector of the AAT, of the other matrix. And moreover, it's the eigenvector with exactly the same eigenvalue. So just, just, just this very, very simple argument shows that, okay? So let's take a look. Um, so I guess the, the remaining part is to basically couple the things, the, these two things together, okay? So again, because AAT is a real symmetric, positive semi-definite even, then I can uh, write its eigen decomposition. So let's call all the eigenvectors of AAT as U, okay? You can start seeing this, those will be the SVD matrices crystallizing there. So it's an orthonormal matrix. It's a square orthonormal matrix, right? So U to U is identity. I could also do U U T. That would also be identity because it's square. It doesn't matter which way I go. If I go on rows or columns, okay. And here is the thing. Uh, The U's are in relationship with the AVI's, okay? That's, 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 that's what we hinted at here. If I, that the eigenvalue, eigen, sorry, eigenvectors of AAT are just the eigenvectors of APA, but they are uh, mul multiplied by A, okay? So the U's must be also somehow closely related to AVI. And basically, the, the answer is that the U's are related to AVI up to scale, okay? So I guess let's first look at what is the square norm of AVI, okay? So the square norm of AVI, well, that's, that's easy enough to figure out. That's VI transpose A transpose AVI, right? But we know that VI is an eigenvector of APA. That's how we started, right? So that means that APA VI is sigma I squared VI, Sigma is just a scalar, so we can put it outside. And VI, that was an orthonormal vector, okay? So that means that the norm of VI is one, okay? So this is just one. So I'm just left with sigma I squared. So that means that the length of ABI is just sigma I, okay? And that means that because because of this relationship, <coughs> me I'll show this uh, one more time here. Because of this relationship, the AVI are basically almost uh, equivalent to the vectors U up to the scale. Or I guess better said is I can order because uh, the eigen decomposition could be ordered in any way I want, but um, I can order the U's so that they correspond to the eigenvector V's, okay? And they are, they are equal up to the scale because the scale of AVI is sigma. All I need to do uh, to make this equal is to scale this by sigma I, okay? Uh, to be specific, uh, this, this ordering we can do only for i going from 1 to r, the rank, because there we have uh, the, the one problem here is that these, these matrices, so the, the, the numbers of eigenvectors of ATA and AAT, they can be the same, right? One has, the ATA has n eigenvectors and AAT has n eigenvectors, okay? So this correspondence here will be true only for the first r of them. Okay. Or in other words, for the first R of them, I can write an ordering of the matrix U such that the U vectors correspond to the V vectors. And that's, again, that's because of this relationship. Okay, I'm just trying to explain it. It's, it's a little, little bit tricky. I'm just trying to explain it as best I, as best I can. 
So because I, I know that AVIs are going to be uh, eigenvectors of AAT, and if I write the eigenvectors of AAT like this, that means uh, at least for the first R of them, which are uh, in correspondence with the V matrix, I can order them so that this is true. Okay. And what's happening here is that the, the U's are, th those are the left singular vectors we are looking for, and the V's are the right singular vectors. And the sigmas, uh, those are the singular values. The sigma is, that's what we had here, that's the square root of the eigenvalue, or that's the eigenvalue of ATA or equivalent the AAT. Okay, so maybe it will make more sense as we uh, go through it further. So once we have done this, um, we can look at A in a different way, okay? So since the VI v vectors, so the VI vectors are the eigenvectors of ATA, okay? They form orthogonal bases for the n-dimensional Euclidean space, okay? So what we can do, we can write any a vector from Rn. Let's take some vector x from Rn. And let's write it in terms of um, coefficients with respect to the basis p. We can do that, right? So if I write the matrix, if I write all the columns of p in a matrix v, so that the matrix means this, right? v is the matrix where all the columns are the eigenvectors. It's the n by n matrix. That's the same we had, we had before. Then I can write this as a matrix vector multiplication, right? So that's just a change of coordinates. We had this many times. And um, if I, because V is orthonormal, I can, I, can, I can invert it, right? I can say that E Y equals V T X. That's because V is an orthonormal matrix, okay? And now let's take a look at the action of A on X. By action, I mean matrix vector multiplication. Okay, applying A to this vector X. So what is going to happen? So my X I can write like this, okay? And now I know that the AV I equals sigma I UI, okay? If I have found my eigenvectors of AATA and AAT and the corresponding single values, okay? So this is sort of like explaining the action of the matrix in terms of single values and singular vectors. So uh, if I, so that's, that's that's just applying this to every single one one of these, and I can write it in the following form: If I put all the vectors u in a matrix u prime, then uh, th this is this is easily equivalent to it, right? Because this matrix just scales the columns of u. So if my in my u prime, there would be u1 up to un. Well, and those would be my uh, single values here. So why there is Oh yeah, uh, the thing that, uh, so here, uh, the one thing we are missing here is the left null space of A, okay? So, um, it's similar, okay, let me, let me explain this uh, separately. Uh, when we were looking at the eigen decomposition of AAT, then we can do similar thing uh, as we did before with V. Okay, maybe let me let me recall first that this thing. When we are looking at the remember when we are looking at the null space of A, we realized that the eigenvectors of ATA, the V vectors, the last n minus r from them, 
they form an orthonormal basis for the null space of A. Okay? We can uh, similarly argue about the left null space of A by looking at the last m minus r vectors here. Okay, so let's take a look at this. If I take the u r plus one, so I'm looking at these, so those are the eigenvectors of AAT, and I look at the last m minus r of them. Okay. Uh, so first, first thing we can realize is they are elements of the left null space of A, so the null space of A transpose. Okay, why is that true? Well, that's 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 easy enough to see because um, remember R is the rank of the matrix. Okay, so after the rank, all the eigenvalues are zero. Okay, so that means the the UIs where eigenvalues, uh, sorry, eigenvectors of AAT, okay, so AAT uh, UI for I going from R plus 1 to M has to be 0, okay, that's because I'm already beyond the rank, so all, all, all the remaining eigenvalues must be 0, okay. And again, by a similar argument, again, it's also true that the null space of AAT is equivalent to the null space of AT. I guess I can just show this directly here. So if I, if I know this, I can, I can hit it from the left with UI transpose, and I will get this, right? Which is nothing but the square norm of AT UI, okay? And that has to be zero. Well, that's only possible if AT UI is zero, which means that UI is from the left null space of A. Okay? Again, from the four fundamental subspaces, we know that the dimension of the left null space is M minus R, okay? And what we have here is M minus R orthonormal vectors. So that's perfect. That means that, again, these guys are exactly on orthonormal basis of the left null space. Okay, and that's what I need to complete the picture here. That's here. So this was the picture that was missing that, but if I uh, complete that, so here the U is the U with all of them going from one to N, so in including the basis for the left null space, and the V includes the basis for the null space, okay? So, uh, you know what's gonna be better? I am going to draw this graphically. That will probably be nicer. So keep it here. So let me do it on the example of the short and fat matrix A. It would be quite similar for the tall and skinny one. So this is my input A matrix. And it's a M by N matrix, okay? And what I did, I found an A matrix, sorry, U matrix. So the U matrix are the eigenvectors of AAT, if you remember that. So this is called U, and this would be an M by M matrix, okay? And it has two parts. The first part is an M by R submatrix, so this would be length R, and this would be M minus R, okay? And here the, the columns would be the U1, U2, and so on up to UR. Here I would go from UR plus one up to UM, okay? So here's the sigma. The sigma has the same dimension as A. And here I have my single values, so here I have sigma 1 up to sigma r okay so this is this is the same dimension as here and i have zeros everywhere else okay so that's my sigma and that's m by n and the last thing here is v so that will have dimension n by n Let's see if i can draw it nicely 
actually V transpose, right? So I have exactly the SVD. That's an N by N matrix. <coughs> and because it's transpose, I have to split it like this. So this is the far part which has R. Again, let me remind you that rank A equals R. And this is the remaining part of N minus R vectors, okay? So again, here I would have V1 transpose. This, this first row would be V1 transpose up to VR transpose. Here I would have VR plus one transpose and so on up to VN, okay? So what I, what I said before about the null space is, is that this is the null space of A transpose, or specifically the columns here are an orthonormal basis for the left null space. The rows here are an orthonormal basis for the null space of A, okay? What I have here is an orthonormal basis for the row span, okay? And what I have here, guess what? I have the basis for the column span here, okay? So this actually ties perfectly with the four uh, fundamental subspaces uh, picture, if you r recall that, yeah, right, right here. I've already explaining this picture a few times, but um, what we see here is that in the SVD we have exactly the orthonormal basis for all these four fundamental subspaces, okay? So the column, span, column space of A is in the U matrix and the null space is its orthogonal complement. And here I have, U is an orthonormal matrix, okay? So here I have orthonormal basis for both of these subspaces, okay? The same thing uh, goes on in the B matrix. So here I have the column, uh, the row span, and null space, okay? Maybe let me uh, just uh, convince you quickly what happens if I take, let's just, let's just play with it a little bit. If I take some vector which is in the span of the vectors vr plus one to vn, okay? So let's see, if I take, so those would be the rows of VT here, okay? So that means I'm taking something from the null space of A. So how can I see from the SVD that it's indeed in the null space of A? So if I take something, uh, some vector X like this, what, what is going to be VTX? What do you think? If I take a vector which is a linear combination of these N minus R last rows of VT. Zero. Well, it's gonna be zero for some part, right? So certainly if, if I'm taking, it's, it's an orthonormal matrix, right? So here indeed, the first R will be zeros, okay? The first R coefficient will be zeros. The remaining ones, they don't have to be, they will be actually exactly the coordinates they'll be exactly the coefficients uh, with respect to this basis, okay? So they might, not, they might not be zero, the remaining n minus r components, okay? But let's see if I now multiply with sigma, what, what's gonna happen? The sigma has non-zeros only in the first r columns, okay? And the remaining n minus r columns, they are completely zero, okay? So at the moment, as, or as soon as I do sigma vtx, I get completely zero, okay? And since this is already zero, then also, of course, this is going to be zero as well, but this is, this is a, right? So that means that ax is zero. So indeed, if I take a linear combination of these vectors, I get something that's in the null space. I guess you, basically the point here is that you can see it directly from the SVD, okay? The same way you can see that if you take, let's say Y, which will be from the span of the last U, U last M uh, minus R vectors of the U matrix of so the span of U R plus one up to U M. By exactly the same argument, you can see that Y transpose A is going to be zero, right? Because again, they are orthonormal vectors.
characters. So here I will have to hit zeros. Here I will have to get non-zeros. But after I multiply with sigma, it's all going to be zero. So indeed, like directly from the SVD, just because the sigma has zeros everywhere else. Okay. So I guess I have a summary. Summary slide here. But you, you can basically see it from the picture. This is just a slide that, that says, says the same thing in words. That the first R columns of U, they are a basis for the span of A. The first R vectors of first R row vectors of VT, equivalently first R uh, columns of V. They are an orthonormal basis for the row space, and these would be the orthonormal basis for the left null space and for uh, the null space. So basically, that's that's the whole point of SVD. It gives you a convenient description of the action of the matrix. Essentially explains the entire matrix in a very convenient way. By the way, the null spaces, as you can see, since they are zeros, the null spaces essentially are not doing anything in terms of explaining the matrix A. Okay, I would basically wouldn't even have to have them there. So indeed, this is actually, so there are several flavors of SVD. This is sometimes called the full SVD because you have everything in it, okay? But if you are only interested in explaining the matrix A, for example, if your matrix A are data and you just care about explaining your data and you don't really care about the null spaces, that, that might easily be the case, right? If you're doing some statistic or something, then you can do a reduced SVD. Basically, you can trim away the fat, <laughs> you can trim away the null spaces, okay? So you can write a decomposition, which is also going to be correct in the sense that the matrix product will recover the original matrix. Let me make sure I get the dimensions right. Let's see R transpose. So what I did here, I discarded this piece here. I discarded all the zeros from sigma and I discarded the last uh, N minus R rows of VT. Okay, so what I got here was an M by R matrix, which are called UR, R like reduced, or R like the rank. This would be R by R matrix sigma, and this would be R by N matrix, okay? So everything is still cool, because it's still true that A equals UR sigma R VR transpose, basically because the zeros were not doing anything in terms of reconstructing the matrix A, okay? I guess this will be very uh, obvious in a second when I when I explain the connection to outer products, the sum of outer products. So this is sometimes called a compact or reduced SVD. The nice thing, the useful thing about this is that here the sigma R becomes invertible, right? Because all the zeros I took away, so the sigma R is a diagonal, and all the elements in the diagonal matrix are. Uh, all the elements on the diagonal are strictly positive, which means that I can actually invert sigma r. That would be one way uh, how you could compute the pseudo inverse, by the way. So I guess you could be you could be wondering why this is actually true, why why I can get get rid of this um, and still explain, still get the same matrix back, right? That basically I can reconstruct the matrix A by just looking at the non-zero single values and single vectors. Well, here is an easy argument for that. It's actually more general, uh, follows from a more general statement. You can rewrite, the statement goes like this, you can rewrite matrix multiplication as a sum of outer products. Did I show you this before? I can't remember. I don't think so, actually, even though this is sort of like a fundamental thing. Well, I can't, no, let's, let's take a look at it again. It's, it's, not, it's not too difficult. So basically, this is a different way to look at product of matrices, matrix product. Okay, very, very, very basic thing, but it's very uh, useful in the context of SVD. So let's take a look at that. So oh, maybe I can just write the two matrices, right? So if this is my matrix A, this would be some other matrix. 
So what I want to do, I want to look at the columns of A. So let's call them A1 up to, so this is M by N. This is N by K. So this would be up to A N, okay? And I'll look at the rows of the B matrix. So they will be B1 up to Bn. And what I'm saying is that the product of the two matrices can be written as the sum of the outer products of the individual rows, uh, sorry, columns and rows, okay? So why is that true? It, that's basically simple. It's basically just a rearranging uh, the summations that go into a matrix, a matrix product, okay? So let's take a look at that. So what is the element in the product of matrices A, B at row I and column J. Well, you should all know this. This is the sum of A, I, L times B, L, J. Okay. That's, I'm just going like 20 lectures back when we are talking about matrix matrix products, okay? Just, just to show this, this formula, which is important for SVD. Well, and let's take a look at the this, this sum of outer products. I don't have to be reminding you what is outer product, I hope. I was already saying this multiple times. So that, that's this funny rank one matrix, right? So this would be sum from one to N. And this would, so this is, this is the sum of outer products, this uh, AL, BL transpose. And if I want to look what is the element in row I and column J, then what does it mean? So, so this will create, I guess maybe I can write it here. So this will give me some uh, product, which will look like M by K, something like this, okay? And if I look, or here, if I take the ith row and jth column, then it means that what I'm summing here is I'm summing A, I just need to get the indices right, so that would be a row I, L, and here B, and here I would be looking at column number J, okay? So basically th this is the sum of order products and I'm looking, that's a matrix, and I'm looking at element on row I, I and column J and I get this. And if I look at the I and J element of the matrix product, I get this. But these two things are exactly the same. Okay, so that implies that indeed the matrix product can be written as the sum of outer products of the, of the individual columns of A with the corresponding rows of B. Okay, it's really, this is really simple. This is just really rearranging the, the, the sums. So why is that important in SVD? Well, it's because if you have the singular value decomposition, it's really asking to be written as the sum of outer products, okay? So if I, if I know that A equals U sigma PT, okay? So first of all, I can look at it, can look at it like this because I know that the sigma is uh, the rank normal form. It has only non zeros only on the diagonal. I can look at the, the U sigma as just scaling of the columns of U with the values of sigma, okay? And from what we said before, um, writing it as a sum of outer products, that means that I can write this as a sum of the single values, UI, VI transpose, okay? From I going from one to R, because obviously there's the zero single values, I don't even have to bother with them in the sum, right? Whatever, whatever was the zeros here, they would just contribute with zeros here, so certainly I don't need that. Is, is that clear? Maybe I can uh, bring back this picture. So, um, this, this matrix multiplication, the U sigma VT, written as sum of outer products, means that I take the first column of U, multiply it with the single value, the first one, and multiply with the first row of VT. Then I add to it the second column of U, 
second times the second single value that's 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 put here right plus uh, the second row of vt and i add all of them but the zero single values i don't have to bother about right because they multiplied with zero so i just as well don't have to write them there okay so that's all that's also the reason why why these two are exactly equivalent I guess you could just see it directly, right? The, z the zeros basically multiply this away to zero, so I can just ch ch check it out. You, you, you could, uh, I guess, argue that way too. Any questions? By the way, uh, here is another consequence of this um, sum of outer products thing that also means that i could uh, basically reorder the columns and rows of v the columns of u and the corresponding rows of vt or I guess, I guess i could say columns of u and columns of v in any way okay i can do any permutation here if i apply the corresponding permutation on the sigmas and on the columns of v i will still get the same thing right that's obvious because this 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 sum is just a sum, so I can just reorder the summons, the terms of the sum in whatever way I want. Okay. So that's one one way how SVD would be not unique. Okay, and that's basically the reason why we are introducing this convention that sigma one is greater or equal than sigma two, and so on up to sigma r, and the sigma r is the last one that's strictly non-zero. The, the remaining ones would be zeros. Okay. W without this convention, we could get many different SVDs. Okay. So, uh, speaking, we, we still need, we still should clarify the uniqueness a little bit. So, so far, uh, we have shown that the SVD always exists. Okay. So, if I, I guess go back, go back here to the theorem, just just to show that that it exists, all we needed to do was to find the matrices U and V. So now we know how to find them. They are the eigenvectors of either ATA or AAT. And the sigma is just the matrix of the square roots of the single values, which I can square root because they are non-negative. And that's, that's it. So because I know that the eigen decompositions always exist, then I know that the SVD always exists. And because of the relationship between U and V, I know that U sigma VT will recover back A. That's basically just the proof, like from, I guess, the 30,000 feet overview of that. So we have shown that the SVD exists always, and it's real, okay? All these matrices are real, so there are no such games like going to complex numbers like we have to do in eigen decomposition. And the remaining question is if the decomposition is unique, or more accurately, how non-unique it is. So, f or on a different, different wording, if I give you A, how many different single value decompositions can you find, okay? So for the first, the first non-uniqueness, the first part of the non-uniqueness, that's the trivial one, that's the easy one. Because I, I just said that you can reorder the columns of U if you correspondingly reorder the columns of V and also the single values, okay? That's, that's the easy one. So we basically rule that out by, by requiring that the single values are ordered, okay? That you have the biggest one on the top and then they decrease and there is the fail of zeros okay so that that's this non-uniqueness we have already taken care of by imposing this condition okay so do you think the svd now is unique think about that yeah i guess that's a cool that's a cool thing to think about if i give you uh if i give you u sigma and vt which multiply together give me back a can be asking if there are some other u sigma and vt's which all satisfy these or maybe maybe except for the last one maybe except for the ordering one well even with the no nah, yeah you're gonna violate the last one so okay so uh, forget about this one <laughs> for a second and think about whether there are some other U sigma and VTs that will satisfy all the other conditions and give me back A. What do you think? Uh, 
there is a, a, a hint is to look again at this sum of outer products okay well actually no 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 actually this one you can still keep this one around and find another SVD of the same matrix yeah so I'm, I'm saying uh, for any matrix you can find several SVD decompositions so the SVD is actually not unique and I would like you to think of one simple example <laughs> Uh, that simple example follows from or is most easily seen from the sum of outer products expression for SVD okay so here is here is how it works you can pick pick any um, I for example I equal one okay and just just flip the sign so just say that I don't know you had or something well will be minus u1 and if I do v hat will be minus v1 okay so clearly if I now do the sum and let's say that the remaining ones are exactly the same okay so if I do uh, sorry u2 let's do it like this ui hat equals ui for and for i going from 2 to m and vi hat will be vi from for i going from 2 to n okay well then if you do this sum of outer products of this ui hat vi hat well guess what you will you will get the same matrix back right because <laughs> the, the signs I, I flip both of them so they just cancel so i'll get exactly the same sum so i'll get exactly the same matrix as before right so that's one reason how svd is not unique i can basically so if i look at it here i can flip the sign of any column here as long as i flip the sign of the corresponding row here as well i still get the same matrix so that's one way how SVD is non unique and let's let's think that I don't really violate anything because if a matrix was orthonormal and I just flip the sign of a, any column or row doesn't matter it will still remain orthonormal right because the length will remain one and the dot products will build be still zero must be on the only thing that changes the sign so if it was zero it's going to be zero even if I multiply by minus one So indeed every, everything is cool, right? The single value I didn't touch, so I can even keep this around and I can find uh, many different decompos single value decomposition of a given matrix. So remember the SVD is non-unique already by this very simple argument. So now we should think about how exactly non-unique it is. How many uh, single value decompositions of a given matrix I can find yes yeah, certainly and uh, it, we, we can characterize it uh, a little bit so basically like what what are the degrees of freedom I have in picking the u and v matrices okay so I can tell you that the Sigma matrix that that is uniquely determined okay I have a uh, freedom in picking the u and v one one because that's like whatever changes you has to correspond to the changes in v. correct correct like you can only change one at a time and the other has to it's like if you change one the other has to fall so it's just one to do well yeah but i can change the u with, with many different ways right i don't have to be flipped for example already here right i wouldn't have to flip just one of them i could just flip two or I could flip columns number one, three, and 17, right? I would have to flip, you're right, that I would have to flip the corresponding columns in V as well so that it cancels and I get the same thing. But I already here, I have two, two R possibilities, right, to do that. M by R. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's... Okay, it's... it's 
well, uh, like may maybe maybe degrees of freedom is the wrong way to think about. <laughs> the right way to think about is in terms of subspaces to, to really understand that. So the first thing you can realize is that the orthogonal basis for the left null space and for the null space I can pick any orthonormal basis there and the SVD will still be perfectly valid, okay? Because as far as the reconstruction of the matrix is concerned, these vectors, they just fall out. They get multiplied by zeros, okay? So I can pick whatever orthonormal basis I please for the left null space and for the right null space. The here they don't even have to correspond, right? I can, because I can, I can rotate these vectors with any matrix I want I can rotate this with arbitrary any other matrix and the SVD will still hold, right? Maybe let me explain this a little bit better. Maybe here. So in general, if I take a matrix B, which has orthonormal columns, okay, such as such as this basis for the null space here, as well as the basis for the, null, uh, for the left null space, as well as the basis for the null space. So that means that BTB is identity, right? Well, I can create an, any other orthonormal, any other orthonormal basis which spans exactly the same, which generates exactly the same subspace, simply by taking QB, where Q is an orthonormal matrix, I guess if, if B was, I guess M, so let's say that B was M by K, so Q will be an orthonormal matrix M by M, okay? And certainly if I do QB, then, then it still has orthonormal columns, the, the entire product, because if I do B, T, Q, T, Q, B, then this thing is identity because Q was orthonormal. So that means this is just BTB, but that was identity, right? So certainly QB also has orthonormal columns. So it basically shows you that I can rotate or even reflect the orthonormal basis and I still get a perfectly valid orthonormal basis, okay? So those are like, I don't wanna say like degrees of freedom. Those are like the, well, they are degrees of freedom if you wanna think about it that way. You can, you can pick these bases in any way you want. So that's one part of it, okay? But that's the part that sort of doesn't matter, right? That the here, here it even falls out, okay? So how, 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 what is the deal with the uniqueness of the reduced SVD? So here we already discarded the null spaces. So how is this unique or non-unique? Let's, let's think about that. We already know that we can flip the signs, right? The corresponding signs in the rows and columns, uh, in the columns of UR and the columns of PR. Here, here it's actually quite interesting in this case. How, how exactly is the SVD non-unique in this case? So the sigma Rs, they are, un, un, they are done, right? They, they, they are unique. Why they are unique? You wanna say, right? why the sigma Rs would be unique? Well, because you arranged it in a particular order. Exactly, yeah. And that they are eigenvalues of a, of a matrix, AT or, or AAT, but we showed that they are the same the eigenvalues are determined uniquely, right? They are just the solutions of the characteristic polynomial, that's it, okay? But uh, the actual columns of UR and VR, they are not, okay? There is some, some leeway there. So what exactly it is? Well, here is the trick. What we need to look at are clustered singular values, okay? So here I have the condition that the single values have to be greater or equal. They have to be decreasing, but in a non-strict way, okay? It can easily happen that you will have a cluster of single values, that you have several single values which have exactly the same magnitude, okay? If I have a singular value 2.13, there is nothing preventing you from that single value being repeated several times. 2.13, 2.13, 2.13, it can appear there multiple times, okay? And that's the key to understanding how non-unique SVD is. By the way, let me make a comment to this as we are talking about this. This typically, if, if your matrix comes from data, 
this repeated single values typically tell you that there is some symmetry in the input data. It's actually pretty cool. If you have like, if you're like analyzing some symmetric data, like I don't know, like if you are measuring like human bodies or something, and there was a symmetry, like bilateral symmetry, then if you did an SVD of the data set, maybe you would discover that some of the single values are repeated, which signifies there is usually some symmetry in your data. And the repeated uh, single values mean that there will be um, some more leeway in choosing the corresponding single left and right single vectors. Okay, let's take a look what exactly it looks like. So let's assume I have, for example, the first k single values will be repeated. Okay, so sigma 1 is the same as sigma 2 and so on up to sigma k. Okay. But what it means if I just look here, it means that the, the corresponding component of the product will look like this. So this will be my, let me call this UK, okay. Here I'll have the part of the sigmas which are the same. So this will be the sigma one. Let me call this just sigma, okay, because they are all the same. So this is sigma, sigma. So they are all the same. And here I have the VKT matrix kt matrix here okay so notice that this thing here because they are all the same so i have a cluster of single values this is just sigma times identity okay that's that's the key thing here because if it's just sigma identity then this is just sigma uk vk transpose okay and you can see how much freedom do i have in picking the orthonorm basis for uk and vkt okay Specifically, I can, if I do this, if I take UK hat, which will be UK times some orthonormal matrix Q, and if I take VK hat, which is gonna be VK times some orthonormal matrix Q, and guess what? If I do UK hat, VK hat transpose, then the Qs annihilate, right? So in this, in this sense, VK transpose, so this is identity. So this is UK, VK transpose. That means that's the same thing, okay? So that's, that's the answer. If I have a cluster of single values, then uh, the corresponding um, basis vectors are determined up to orthonormal transformation. Okay. In other words, this generates some subspace. Okay. The columns of U generate some subspace. And in UK, I can have an arbitrary orthonormal basis of that subspace as long as I apply the same transformation to the VK, to the corresponding block of the right single vectors V. Okay. So here it's a little bit different than in this case. Here I could just pick any, any basis here and the basis here for the null spaces. But here I have to rotate both of them by, by the same, or rotate, rotate or reflect by the same orthonormal matrix. So that's like a transformation. Yes, 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 yes. In some applications, this is actually useful. I have seen it in one Pixar paper, which was doing some like data-driven animation for, for facial animation. I think it was in The Incredibles. And they used exactly this trick to get better, uh, more sparse basis vectors. So, so, sounds, sounds like crazy, but it has actual uh, practical implications. Oh, by the way, the case of just a single, uh, if, the, if the singular value is not clustered, if there's just one unique one. So if your singular values look like 6.3, 5.17, 4.2 or whatever. So this one is not clustered, right? But this multiplication by minus one, you can basically see this as a multiplication by one by one orthonormal matrix, right? Let's have a very quick discussion how it looks like, what are one by one orthonormal matrices? One by one matrix, right? That's the simplest case of a matrix. And if I'm asking you what all, what, what, <laughs> I can't even say it's so simple. I want to see how all, uh, what are all one by one orthonormal matrices? There's one, and there is? All the numbers. 
No, no, no. So what, what is the definition of an orthonormal matrix? The length must be one and the individual columns and rows must be orthogonal, right? If, if I have a one by one matrix, I have just one row and one column, negative so one. nothing, negative one, exactly. There's nothing to be orthogonal. So I just am looking for a number such that the length of the number is one, right? There are two of them. There is plus one and minus one, okay? So I'm saying this basically, this is just, this also applies to the case when they are actually not clustered, when there is just one. I can still multiply by one by one orthonormal matrix. Okay, that's, that's exactly the same idea. When, when, it, when it happens to be a cluster, then I actually have more freedom, right? Then I can, for example, be applying rotations. If it's just a single, unique, non-clustered single value that I can only multiply the corresponding left and right single vectors by plus or minus one. So basically, this is not like a special case, right? This, this, this also falls into this picture here. Okay, so I believe now I confused everyone. <laughs> so I think that's a good time to do an example. Or like a simpler, I guess I will not do a full example. I will just do an easier case. Let's take a look. Uh, no, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a geometric interpretation for a two by two case, okay? What does the SVD mean uh, intuitively or geometrically? And I will assume that A is invertible to make it even easier so you don't have to bother about all the null spaces. So that means that the rank is two, okay? So how do we find SVD in this case? So what does it mean to find SVD? In this case, we have to find vectors V1 and V2 u1 and u2 in this case they are both from r2 of course and we have to find the corresponding single values which are non-negative scalars right and what we want is that v1 is uh, orthogonal to v2 u1 is orthogonal to u2 they have all norm one norm of vi is norm of ui that's one or one and two and I also need that A V I equals sigma I U I. Okay. That's that's basic that's so I have the the A equals U sigma V ah. property. So basically the one way you can look at it geometrically, what I need to do is to find so the task is to find v1 and v2 from r2 such that v1 is orthogonal to v2 and and that's the that's the key thing here the image of v1 by a is also orthogonal to image of v2 so if i transform both of them by a they will also be orthogonal that's the tricky part right if I, if I ask you to find in plane an or two orthogonal vectors, that's like really simple, right? You can just pick, pick one arbitrarily, pick another one, okay? Well, but then the matrix A maps it somewhere, okay? So ah, maybe I should put it here, so. So I just pick like, without thinking about it too much. The matrix A maps this somewhere. I, don't, I could find that so this is, this is V1, this is V2, they are orthogonal here, but if I'm not careful about it, I can find that AV1 looks like this and AV2 looks like this, okay? So that's not good. What I need to find here is special V1 and V2, so I have to be clever about choosing them. So there's gonna be some special pair of V1 and V2 such that when I apply A, that means this means apply A, I will get uh, AV1 and I will get AV2, which actually, oops, I meant AV1 and AV2, which actually are orthogonal. There is right angle between them, okay? After I've done this, it's a very easy matter of just saying that my UI is just gonna be an AVI normalized. Okay, so that means if this was unit length, that these, these guys would be unit length. So this would be the U2, this would be U1. 
And this basically tells you like the geometric picture of SVD. Okay, so the SVD base, so what SVD does geometrically, it finds an orthogonal basis in the source space. In, both th in these cases, it's both R2, right? The matrix here goes from R2 to R2, but this one is the source one, this one is the target one. That's where the mapping goes from, that's where the mapping goes to. And it finds the basis in the source space and in the target space, such that the matrix with respect to these two bases will be just scaling. Okay, that's 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 really the point of SVD, because all the matrix. So if I, now if I have any vector here, right, I can write it as I can decompose it into parts, orthogonal decomposition into V1 and V2 parts, right, and what the matrix does, it simply maps the V1, A V1. Where do I have it? A V1 equals sigma one U1. It maps it onto U1 and scales it by sigma one, okay? The component in V2, well, same story, right? Gets scaled by sigma two and goes in the direction of U2. That's, that's this one, okay? So basically that's the geometric picture is the SVD finds the two bases in the source space and the target space, such that the matrix reduced to just uh, non-uniform scaling. That's exactly what the sigma matrix is, right? That's exactly what you can see, for example, from here, even though the geometry might not be immediately obvious. Here, the matrix sigma, so the U and V, they are orthonormal matrices, so they just change coordinates, okay? One changes coordinates in the source space, the other one in the target space, okay? And th the whole action of the matrix A basically is then, with respect to these two bases, is then encoded in the sigma matrix, which is so simple, it's just a non-uniform scaling. And again, maybe we can do it the next time, or if you are interested, we can just walk through the 2D example, how to find the U and V matrices. It's also like an easy numerical example we can, we can just do. Let me think about what would make most sense. But you, you already know what to, how, how, how to do that, right? The, because we had it for the general case before, so you would just take APA, that would give you the VI vectors as eigenvectors. You would do AA, AA transpose, that would give you the U's as the eigenvectors of AAT. And that's, that's that, okay? All right. I think I will have to spend some time on Monday to deconfuse you about the CNA. <laughs> Do you have any questions right now? All right, so <laughs> I'll see you again on Monday.